Good morning. Welcome to Searching the Scriptures. My name is Keith Freer. I'm the local minister here at the Harrisburg Church of Christ. I want to personally thank you for taking the time to view our broadcast this morning. We hope you'll become a regular viewer each Sunday morning as we search the Scriptures. We also have a radio program that airs just prior to this broadcast from 7.45 to 8 a.m. on your AM dial 1420 WHBN entitled The Message of Truth. Please give it a listen. We have a very extensive website. Church of Christ at Harrisburg.com. You'll find all of these TV programs there listed by title, by alphabetical order. you also see our radio programs that are on MV3 files that can be downloaded, and the TV programs can be downloaded to watch on your, on your laptop or your PC or your uh, Kindle device. And we also have a host of other Bible-related material, free correspondence courses. We have home Bible studies we offer. We also have overviews of every book in the Bible that can be downloaded and examined. And there's just a host of other material that will be a help to you in your study of God's Word. Please give a look and let us know what you think. We also, at the end of this broadcast, will give you the regular meeting times of our services at the Harrisburg Church of Christ. We cordially invite you to any of all of these services. You will always be warmly received. We will make no demands of you. We're not, we don't want to try to intimidate you. All we want you to do is come, study God's Word with us, worship Him, and let us demonstrate through the Scripture you need to have a relationship with God and especially to have one with His Son. And if we can help you in any way, please do not hesitate to call upon us. Last Lord's Day, we began a study entitled, Why Are There So Many Churches? Men have asked me this in a number of occasions when I've been overseas preaching, and I've been asked on a few occasions here in this country, why are there so many churches? And we began to examine the answer to that last week, and we left off showing that the growth of the early church in all of these different areas that you can read about in the book of Acts, they all produced Christians because all of them were taught the gospel. They were taught the same seed, and that seed produced a Christian. That's what we find in the Bible. That's the pattern of growth of the early church. And the pattern was that the seed, the gospel of Christ, was planted in the heart of the unbeliever, and upon their acceptance and obedience of it, they were added to the Lord's church. And we see that in every conversion in the book of Acts. They all believed the same message. They all had the same seed. And they all resulted in becoming Christians. Now, oh, in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 17, the Apostle Paul wrote that he taught this message every place he went and in every church. He didn't teach a different message in different areas. He didn't teach one message in Corinth, one in Ephesus, one in Thessalonica, one in Berea, one in Philippi. No, wherever he went to plant the Lord's church, he taught the same message. He taught the same duty and responsibility. The discipline of the church. The church is to be subject to Christ. We read that last week. And Jesus commissioned and equipped the apostles. What did he tell them to do? To go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Matthew 28, verse 19. In John chapter 16, verse 13, prior to him being arrested and eventually being crucified, he promised to send them the Holy Spirit that would guide them into all truth. John 16, verse 13. And the apostles then reveal all that truth and... That's what they taught to the unbelievers in order to convert them to Christ. In Acts 20, verse 27, the Bible says that Paul did not declare, did not de uh, declare, did not shun the whole counsel of God. He preached the whole counsel of God. He didn't leave anything out. And in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 3 through 5, Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 through 5, Paul said in his letter to the church at Ephesus, he said, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages has not been made known to the Son of Man, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy prophets and apostles. You see, it was revealed. That message of truth was revealed to the apostles through the work of the Holy Spirit, and they wrote it down by being led by the Holy Spirit, and that's what we have today. We have the revealed mind of God revealed to us, and the church was and is to be governed by that word. It is to be governed by that word. In Jude 1 verse 3, it talks about the common salvation. 
Why is it a common salvation? Because we all adhere to the same doctrine and the same principle. 2 Timothy 3 says all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And then verse 17 adds that it equips man for every good work. And Colossians 3.17 says that whatever we do in word or deed, we must do all in the name of the Lord. We must have his authority. And so the church, the early church, was commissioned and equipped before the church even began. The apostles were sent out to preach the gospel to every creature. And then that gospel was revealed through the Holy Spirit to the apostles and the prophets. And they wrote it down. Then by when we read, we might understand. And this was and is to be the law that governs the Lord's church. That's why we must have his authority for everything that we do. But the Bible says there would be a falling away. Now we have evidence of this, even back as far as the Old Testament. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God told them that they could eat of every tree in the garden except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They didn't listen, and they disobeyed God. And when they did, sin came into the world. And when sin came into the world, God had warned them in Genesis 2, 16 and 17, that in the day that they ate of it, they would die spiritually, and they did. In Genesis 3, 24, they were driven from the Garden of Eden. They fell away. They fell away from God. They broke fellowship with God. Why? Because of sin. We see the same thing in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, God looked down upon man, saw that his heart was evil continually, and he determined to destroy the world in which he created, and he was going to destroy that which he created with a worldwide flood. But Genesis 6, 8 says that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Why did he find grace? Him and his three sons and their wives. Because they were obedient. Genesis 6 to 22, after giving Noah and his sons the instructions for the ark, the Bible says, Thus did Noah, according to all that God commanded him, so did he. You see, those delivered from Egypt fell away. They were in Egypt. They were in bondage for, over, for many, many years. And they prayed to God. They asked for the deliverance. God sent in Moses. And by the ten plagues, and demonstrating his power, and that Pharaoh wasn't the greatest in the throne, that God was more powerful than Pharaoh, and God was the rulers in the kingdom of men. They were released. They were, they were allowed to go, and they were traveling to the promised land. And then they came to the borders of Canaan. They sent spies in, and the spies feared what they saw, and they were afraid to go in. But because of their unbelief in Numbers chapter 14, beginning in verse 28 through 32, because of their unbelief, God caused them to wonder for 40 years. And every man over 20 that came out of Egypt, except Joshua and Caleb, the two favorite spies, faithful spies, they died in the wilderness. Why? Because of unbelief. They fell away. They disobeyed God. And then we see the nation of Israel. It fell in, it was divided in 928 B.C. It was divided after the death of Solomon. And then we see the ten northern tribes that made up the northern kingdom. They went into spiritual adultery. They committed idolatry. They followed false gods, and they were destroyed by Assyria in 722 B.C. And we see that Judah fell 135 years later, beginning in 586 B.C., to the Babylonians. And then they were restored after 70 years. Jeremiah prophesied after 70 years they would come out, and then they they began a restoration period beginning in 535 to 539 as they began to go back to Jerusalem and to rebuild the temple. And the nation is not divided any longer. Now it is one nation when it comes out of captivity. But I want you to notice biblical history shows that the falling away occurred when men disobeyed God's word. When men disobeyed God's word, it resulted in a falling away. It did then and it will now. Just like it did then, it accomplishes the same thing today. And Jesus warned that there would be false teachers. He said in Matthew 7, there will be wolves in sheep's clothing. In chapter 24, talking about the destruction of Jerusalem, he says there will be wars and rumors of wars. and People will claim to be Christ and they will claim many different things, but they will be false. They won't be, they won't be true. They won't be accurate. And the Bible says Paul warned that apostasy was going to take place. He told the elders of Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, beginning in verse 28 through 32, that after his departure, that grievous wolves would come in from among themselves, from within the church. And they would lead disciples away from God. They would take those away from God and lead them out of the church. 
And Paul warns him that that's going to happen. And the protection of that, he told them, he commended them to the word of God, which was able to edify them and build them up and to keep them from harm if they would follow it, believe it, and obey it. And in 1 Tim Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 1 and 5, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and we'll read a couple of these verses. 1 Timothy 4, beginning in verse number 1. Scripture says, and the Spirit is thus he says, that in the latter time some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience sealed with a hot iron, forbidding to marry, and commanding to abstain from food which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. You see, there's going to be a falling away. Men are going to begin to teach things that are not true and say that they're part of God's word. He says it's going to be false. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, young Timothy is told to preach the word in season and out of season. Why? Verse 3 warns why. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap to themselves teachers, and they will, be turned, they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned again to fables. You see, they're going to turn away. And Paul wrote in such and such uh, uh, Second Thessalonians, and I want to read this because it's important for us to know. In Second Thessalonians, chapter two, we're going to begin reading in verse ten. Second Thessalonians two, verse ten, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness. God says if you don't love the truth, if your heart's not grounded and firm and planted in the truth, and if you don't love the truth, then you will believe a lie. And God will allow you to believe that lie. He'll allow you to believe the delusion. But why do you believe the delusion? Because you don't love the truth. And you're going to be condemned, not because you're a bad person, but because you denied the truth. You did not believe the truth. Therefore, you will fall for delusion. And that's why we're to preach the word, that men might not fall prey to the delusion. And Peter mentioned the reality of false teachers in his epistle in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. He said, but there will also be false prophets among the people, even as there will be false prophets among you, who will bring in destructive heresy, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their destructive ways because of whom the way of truth is blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle, and the destruction does not slumber. He says that false teachers are reality. Biblical history warns us that men will try to lead men away from God. That they will change, they will alter, they will amend. They will put their own theories and their own thinking. And they will lead men away from God. God's prophets and the inspired writers warned us that that would happen. It happened in the first century. It's happening in the 21st century. There are men who claim to be religious, who claim to be messengers of God, who claim to love God, claim to love the Bible, and yet they're leading people further and further away from God. Why? Because they are not preaching the truth. They are not rooted and grounded in the truth. They're grounded and rooted in another message. And what that does is lead people into apostasy. It is the falling away. And John said in his letter, in 1 John chapter 4, listen to the words of the Apostle John in the fourth chapter of the first letter in verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. John said, you've got to be careful. Don't believe everything you hear. Open your Bible. Open your mind. Check out what you're told. Make sure that it's what God's Word says. Why? Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. In the first century, it was called Gnosticism, denying the deity of Christ, the, denying the humanity of Christ in some cases. It was belief in false gods and idolatry, just like in old biblical times. You see, that was coming. That was going to happen. And he was preparing them for it by making sure that they tested everything they were taught, whether or not it was rooted and grounded in the truth. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is the same precaution that men need to take today. I don't want you to take my word for it. Don't believe it because you hear me say it. Don't believe it because I'm a preacher and that means that I'm knowledgeable and I got all the answers and you should listen to me. I'm telling you, I'm giving you the book, I'm giving you the chapter, I'm giving you the verse. Look it up, read it, study it, see if that's what it says. And as I've told you in past, uh, in past lessons, if you can show me that I've mishandled the Word of God, that I've said something that God's Word doesn't say, if you can show me where it's incorrect, if you can show me that it's inconsistent and it contradicts another fact of truth, you bring it to my attention, I'll count you as my dear friend. I'll get on this program and I'll recant that. But will you be honest enough to leave what you believe if you find out it's not according to the truth, if you find it's contrary to God's will, if you find out that what you believe is false doctrine, false teaching, and you've been taught falsely by a, a, a person who claims to be religious? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I don't know why people do it. I'm not going to get into the heart of the teacher. I don't know why he does it. I'm not going to get into to whether I know why he does it. I don't. But I do know if it's not according to God's word, it's false, it's dangerous, and it will cause you to fall away. God warned us about that, and that's why we're to test everything that we hear. The presence of false teaching in Acts chapter 15, when the Gentiles were obeying the gospel in the first century, the Jews were trying to bind the law of Moses on the Gentiles in order for them to be saved. They had to go back and not only do the things contained in the gospel, but they also had to be circumcised. That was an Old Testament law. That's what they were trying to do, and what they were doing was adding to God's word. In Acts 15, 24, the Bible says they gave no such commandment. Paul used the argument in Galatians chapter 5 that they have fallen away from grace, that they have fallen away from grace because they were trying to add things to the gospel that God did not add. And then the Colossians 2, he takes care of this problem too, when they were trying to bind both laws, the old and the new. Well, you know what? That's not new. Men are still trying to do that today. They're trying to bind the old and the new. But the old law was nailed to the cross, Colossians 2.14. The vision was condemned in the church of Corinth. Listen. Listen to Paul's letter, first letter to the Corinthians. He says in verse 10, Now I plead with you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you speak the same thing, that there be no division among you, that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Notice, division was condemned. Division was condemned in the first century. Why? Because they weren't speaking the same thing. Why? Because they were not in the same mind. They were not in the same judgment. Why? Because they were following men instead of following God. If you continue reading, some of them were calling themselves after Apollos, some after Cephas, some after Paul, and some after Christ. They were making themselves disciples of the men that converted them. Well, you know how Paul answers that? How did Paul show that that was a wrong concept? He asked him two questions. He said, number one, who was crucified for you? Well, that's easy. It wasn't Peter. It wasn't Paul. It wasn't Cephas. It wasn't Apollos. It was Christ. They were disciples of Christ, not disciples of those men. And number two, what were they baptized in? They weren't baptized in the name of Paul. They were baptized in the name of Peter or Cephas or Apollos. They were baptized in the name of Christ by his authority. Read Romans chapter 6, 3 and 4. Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. They were baptized in the name, anyone's name, except that of Christ. And so again, this is apostasy. Division is condemned. But that's exactly what we have today. We have all kinds of division over many, many different things. And we have it because we're not all following the same rules. There were those who possessed the spirit of preeminence. The after season, 3 John, verse 9 and 10. Not only was he not content to have men following him because he wanted to have the preeminence, he wanted to have first place, but he also tried to keep others from joining because they were a he looked at them as a threat and he tried to keep others out because he was afraid that they would lead them back to Christ. You see, that is a preeminent spirit. That's a danger. That's a false that's a false teacher. When men are trying to convert the others to themselves, those are not true disciples of God. Those are not true ministers of God. They are those who are trying to convert men to themselves, who want to put themselves on the pedestal and make them to be the Savior, but they're not the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior. Five of the seven churches of Asia had begun to travel the road of apostasy. Read those 
seven letters in Revelation 2, verse 3. He said, I have this against you. Why? Because they had done certain things. They had left the teaching of Christ. Five of the seven churches were going in the wrong direction. They had started on the right path. They had obeyed the gospel. They, they had begun to follow him, but then they began to drift. They began to move. And he writes these seven letters in order to tell them that God's giving them time to repent, to correct their mistake, to get back on that straight and narrow path that we read about in Matthew chapter 7, 13 and 14. And if they did, he was going to remove their candlestick, which simply means he was not going to recognize them as one of his. And so, yes, you can fall away. You can begin to apostatize. You can fall away from the truth. You're a free moral agent. You came out of the world a free moral agent. You didn't have to obey. You did. And you could go back to that which you love. And when you do, you fall away. And we're warned that the false teacher and the workers of Satan are going to try to get you to do that. They're going to try to get you to apostatize and go back into that which you love. That's the falling away. And the falling away is why we have so many churches. It's because men are giving men a, a, a choice. They're giving men a choice. You can do this. You can do that. You can have it this way. You can have it that way. You can live like this or you can live like that. And you can worship like this or you can worship like that. So they're giving men a choice, just like buying a car, like going where you go on vacation, buy what kind of house you buy. And they're just making religion the same kind of thing. But the problem is, this does not give that authority. This does not give men that kind of choice. They have two choices. They can accept it or reject it. That's the only two choices he has. And if he goes after something else, then he's rejected it. Falling away. You see, in biblical history, there's a gradual departure from God's Word. It began in the 5 600. It began in the 5th and 6th century. See, they changed the organization of the church. The Lord said that there would be elders over every church, Acts 14.23. An elder was to have local oversight over a local church. Read 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2. The elders are overseers. They don't make rules. They don't change laws. They are to make sure that men follow God's law. And they are local. They are over a local church. There's a Church of Christ in Lawrenceburg. There's one in Danville. Both of those churches have elders in their oversight. They have no jurisdiction here in Harrodsburg. They only have oversight in Danville where they're at, or in Lawrenceburg where they're at. You see, that was the biblical pattern. That was the pattern of the organization of the church that God gave. Well, Catholicism began to change that. They, did, they had a presiding elder. They had one elder that was above all the other elders. And then they had a bishop of distinction, one that was different, one that was higher than the other bishops. Then they began to have met metropolis bishops. They're over certain metropolis, over area. Then they have a diocese bishop that begin to be over many cities instead of one. Then they have archbishop that goes to major cities like Alexandria, Jerusalem, Antioch, Constantinople, and Rome. And then eventually in 606 it led to one universal bishop called the Pope. But you see, this is an earthly organization. This is a falling away. This You can't find this in the Bible. Where do you find the Pope? Where do you find... Archbishop, diocese bishop, metropolis bishop, presiding elders. Where do you find that? You have to go to the catechism book. You have to go to the teaching of the Roman Catholicism. You can't find that in the Bible. Why? Because that's a falling away. That's a distinction because that's a different seed. That's a different seed. You can't learn how to do this, and you can't learn about what the Roman Catholic Church is without going to their literature. Because it's a different seed. See, this is the way it worked. It just gradually got further and further away from the truth. And what we have is we have the falling away. And then it finally it went to the Pope. And that's still that way today. They have cardinals. They have bishops. They have archbishops. Where do you find all that? Where would you go? And how to organize that. How do we learn how to organize that? To organ the organization of the Roman Catholic Church, you can't find in the Bible. It's not in the Bible. You have to go to their teachings. You have to go to their rules. Because it's not fall, it's not in the Bible. That's a falling away. That's why we have a Roman Catholic Church. Because they fell away from the original church. And they changed the organization and then they got further and further and further and further away. They just kept expanding it by what they thought 
that they should do. And today in the, in the Catholic Church, the Pope is considered the vicar of Christ. He believed to be God's spokesman on earth. Well, no, that's not true, because Jesus said that's not true. In Matthew 28, 19, he said, in excuse me, verse 18, that he had all power in heaven and in earth. If he has all power in heaven and earth, that doesn't leave any for the Pope. And so that's a misconception. That's a misunderstanding of what the scripture teaches. Then you have the Council of Nicaea, who now makes Christianity that they can't be punished for. They accept Christianity, and now it's not punishable. Then you have the Latin Mass in 394. Then you have purgatory. Where do you read about that in the Bible? You don't read about purgatory anywhere. What about transubstantiation, where the bread and the fruit of the vine literally turn into the body and blood of the Lord? Where do you read that in the Bible? It's not in the Bible. What about celibacy of the priest? That the priests are... They can't be married. They must be celibate. What do you read about that in the Bible? Where's that rule at? And what about indulgences? In, in the uh, 12th century, they begin to sell indulgence. That means the right to sin. And you know what's sad about that? Those indulgent, they sold them during World War II. You know, men were going to be away from their wives for years, maybe one year, two years, three years. And so they sold them indulgent, indulgences that they would, so they, they might sin while they're gone, and with those indulgences and the money they received, they built the Vatican. But what do you read about indulgences in the Bible? What do you read about that? What about our confession, where you go to, a, to a, a, a priest and you confess your sin, and he gives you absolution? What do you read down in the Bible? We confess our sins to God, not to man. God's the only one that can forgive sin, not man. What about sprinkling? What do you learn about sprinkling? You don't read about that in the Bible. That was something enacted in 1311. Then you have in 1517, Martin Luther, he nailed 95 pieces to the door of the All Saint Church in Wittenberg. He was opposed to the Catholic Church. This is the beginning of denominationalism. He was writing the 95 things that he took issue with the Roman Catholic Church. But what he did is he didn't get back to the original gospel. He created a denomination. It's called Luther. His goal was to change the traditions of the Catholic Church. Why? Because they were corrupt. They were immoral. He wanted to change them. That's good, but what he did is he created another problem. He created denominationalism. Whatever is not against Scripture is for Scripture and Scripture for it. Where do you read that at? You don't read that in the Bible. You read that in the Handbook for Denominations. Page number 132. Then you have Zigwe. What the Bible does not command, we may not do. He gave up images, crosses, indulgences, observing the mass, the practice of celibacy, and the use of organs in the church. You know why he did that? Because he couldn't find it in the Bible. He couldn't find the authority in the Bible. In 1522, he mounted a protest against the fast and it went, a standard Catholic practice. Why? Because you couldn't find about that in the Bible. Let me ask you something closing this point. If you wanted to, to commemorate when, if you wanted to keep it, could you go to the Bible and find out how to do that? If you wanted to celebrate the religious practice of Easter or Christmas, could you go to the Bible and know how to do that? No, you can't do that. Why? Because that teaching is not in God's Word. So what am I telling you? In closing this morning, the reason that we have so many churches is that we have so many theories. We have so many human theology doctrines. We have so many teachings. We have so many creed books. We have so many human theories. And all these theories are giving men a choice. And men can join the church of their choice. But the problem is, you need to consider to join the church of the Lord's choice. And if you want to join the Lord's church, you're going to have to look in the only place where you can find the instruction how to do that. And it it's not in a catechism book. It's not in a discipline book. It's not in a manual. It's not in any human piece of writing. It's only found in the gospel of Christ, which is contained in the word of God. And so in closing this morning, what about you? What church do you belong to? Do you belong to a church of the Lord, or do you belong to the church of men? And if you belong to the church of men, and it's not the church that Jesus promised to build, and it's not the one you find in the Bible, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to be honest enough? Are you going to be forthright enough? Are you going to be honest with yourself that you're going to go back to the Bible, see where you made your mistake, and correct it? 
or are you comfortable where you're at? And you think it really doesn't matter. We're all going to heaven, we're just getting there by different roads. Well, that's a lesson for another day. But what I want you to do is be honest with yourself. Can the church that you are a member of, that you belong to, can you find the instruction and the guidelines for what you do and how you do it in this book, or do you need some other document? If you do, then you are not a member of the church that Jesus built. Because the one that Jesus built can only produce Christians. And